May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And as we gather, uh, Pamela and Allison will offer hymn number 362 for those of you who have books at home. Jesus, good above all other. Let us worship God together. Gathered in song, friends, let us unite our hearts and minds in prayer. I invite you to stand as we pray together. Lord God of hosts, you gather your people from far and near. You join us by your spirit through technology or in this place. You have invited us to celebrate you, for you are worthy of all, pla all praise. To you alone is due our worship. It is you that set the table that calls us together as a family. Be with us as we gather, whether in person or online. Be present with us in this sacrament that we will share. Help to remind us of the good you have in mind for us when we share in your scriptures and when we encounter you in bread and wine. Be among us and receive our worship, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. For those of you who are here with us, you have a copy of our responsive reading for this morning. Uh, I've shared it on the screen for those of you who are able. Uh, if you're on the telephone, um, I encourage you to listen reverently for this word from God, which we will share from Exodus chapter 20. In Exodus, of course, as the people have been freed from their Egyptian bondage and they find themselves at the foot of God's holy mountain, they are made aware of the rules that God would have them live by, rules that have come to us as the Ten Commandments. And as we share those this morning, I would invite you to think about how how they have shaped our society, how they have shaped our lives, how they have
have embedded themselves in us. For in a moment, we will hear Jesus' interpretation of what those mean. But for the moment, let us encounter a word from God together in Exodus 20. This is taken from verses 1 to 17. As recorded in Exodus 20, God spoke all these words, Holy are you, Lord God of hosts. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Holy are you, Lord God of hosts. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth, you shall not bow down to them or worship them. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For six days, for in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. And therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Holy are you, Lord God of hosts. Honor your father and mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Holy are you, Lord God of hosts. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Holy are you, Lord God of hosts. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Holy are you, Lord God of hosts. Amen. Thus far, a word from Holy Scripture. As has become our habit, <coughs> excuse me, I invite you to stand for the reading of the Gospel, which comes to us today from the 22nd chapter of Matthew, verses 34 to 40. Jesus is answering questions and engaging with the religious authorities of the day. And this question stands out among all others. Please stand as we share in the gospel. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. In the name of God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, I'm bold to bring you these words this morning. Amen. So let's imagine for a moment 
a world that insists on perfection, a world full of rules where failure to follow the rules brings grave consequences. Imagine living every moment fearful that your next step, your next act, your next word or thought would bring doom to you or your family or your community. What would you do to keep yourselves safe? What would you do to avoid angering the cosmos? Would you dance, sing, pray, sacrifice? <laughs> Would you fight? Throughout history, it's been recorded that humans will do all of these things and more to keep themselves safe. From earliest recorded time, we humans have tried to make sense of the world around us by explaining away the chaos. Rituals, rituals become good luck charms offered to ensure that the cycle of seasons is not interrupted. And these rituals take on greater meaning when a traumatic event disrupts the hunt or the harvest. Many, many pre-scientific societies invented explanations for natural events and then developed religious reactions to what they could, to do what they could to bring balance to things. Now, I don't say this as a, as a criticism, it's just how humans work. We want to figure things out. We need to protect ourselves. And this is, this is what we do. And some of these rituals, I have to say, were, were delightful and lovely. They found ways, early humans did, to honor the majesty of creation and to celebrate the complex beauty and bounty of nature. Many of these are beautiful tributes to the mystery of creation some, some became glorified superstitions that sprung from nagging doubts and towering fears. And that's the problem. For when doubt and fear rule the day, it is easy to conclude that it is the rules and the rituals that are what keep you safe from the dangers of a chaotic world. Now many ancient Near Eastern and Mediterranean societies developed religious practices and habits that were meant to do just that, to keep the chaos at bay, to satisfy the gods who created that chaos at a, at a whim. And what first made the religious habits of the Hebrew people different was their acknowledgement of one God. And what's more, this was a God not of chaos, not a God who needed to be appeased in order to maintain order and good relations. This was a God who had imposed order on chaos with just a word. That's a remarkable change in religious practice. And so, as the Hebrews get themselves organized and they find their way out of Egypt to the holy mountain, and they, they start to look to God for rules to live by, they've seen these habits all around them. There must be patterns and habits and rules that we need, God. And they are rewarded with the Ten Commandments. 
not a system of ritual sacrifice. That system developed later as a response to individual circumstances covered by these 10 rules. But first they get these commandments. They record them. They are given by God. They are written in stone according to the Torah. And each of these commandments is a subtle reminder that God intends for God's people to live lives of order, not chaos. These, these commands, as we have them in Exodus and in Deuteronomy, are the epitome of peace. Love and worship God alone. Honor yourselves by honoring God during a day of rest. Respect is not a strong enough word. The Hebrew word is chabad, glorify your parents. Honor them. Don't kill or cheat or lie or covet. In other words, keep peace within the, the larger family of the community. And on the face of it, these are fairly simple rules, aren't they? Simple rules. Do this, don't do that, it's, it'll be okay. And since they were revealed, we have found ways to complicate them, to justify ourselves in them, to find righteousness through them. Should have been simple. And yes, out of these 10 commandments grew the great maze of Levitical law, 690 some specific rules for specific circumstances. But what happens if my neighbor's ox falls into an uncovered well and dies, it's not my fault. Okay, well, we've got a rule for that. So the law grows into something that it was not intended to be. And it even shows up in some of our own civil law all these thousands of years later. Yet even in Jesus' day, the debate around the exceptions and exemptions and special circumstances was part of religious and social discourse. How do we achieve righteousness by following the rules? And it is in the midst of one of these conversations that Jesus offers to make it simple again. He has humiliated one group of the religious elite already. He has caught them in a trap of words of their own making. And another group of religious experts comes and says, so we have a test for you, teacher. What is the greatest commandment? Now this, this is a trap. These conversations turn on themselves and devour themselves in an instant. And if you don't believe me, try having a legal conversation in Tim Hortons someday and watch what happens. What's the most important law in the canon of law? Well, that depends on what side of the law you're on, doesn't it? Teacher, what is the greatest commandment? If you're really paying attention, you'll notice that Jesus doesn't answer from Moses directly. Jesus answers with the Shema. Hear, O Israel, God is one and one alone, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Jesus might have been caught by the answer that he gave to this. Because they, the elite, want to be in control of the chaos that their own system has created. They set the rules. They tell you where to go 
and what to do. But Jesus answers as he does because he knows that the law of God is about order and peace. And his answer reflects the harmony of these ten rules to live by. Jesus knows and is trying to demonstrate that the commandments do not function in isolation, either from one another nor from our lives. They are part of a whole, and they are consistent with the nature of the one who inspired them in the first place. So together, this collection of rules generates devotion and makes good relations. Love God. Love your neighbor as yourself. These are the summary, the summary of all the law and the prophets. And by Jesus' day, the law had grown exponentially, hadn't it? And the prophets had been shouting warnings for generations. And Jesus says two statements. These two statements are all you need to know. As always, Jesus would lead us to the heart of the matter. In his explanation, love is the measure of the law. Indeed, love is the measure of all things. Love is what matters. The relationships among, around, and within us are what matter if we are to make order and keep peace. Now, we might jump forward 2,000 and some years. I would acknowledge that it has been challenging, especially in the last six or seven months, it has been challenging to tend to those critically important relationships. Even within the community of faith, or especially within the community of faith, perhaps. Our worship has been radically different. Our social interactions have been greatly reduced and tightly controlled, and all for very good reason. And as we find ourselves working our way back and finding new ways to do familiar things, it's frustrating. It makes us angry. We are grieving what once was, even as we rewrite the rules. And if you're not sure, or if you haven't been frustrated or angry about this, then you haven't encountered me in the middle of the week in a weak moment. It's frustrating from the front of the room too. I'm grieving what used to be And yet, the two things that Jesus said are most important are never far from us. It would be much easier, much easier, to throw all caution to the wind. The heck with it. We'll just do what we know how to do. We'll do it normally. We'll go back to whatever normal was. There's no denying that would be easier. Except the two things that Jesus said were most important, the laws of love, the two great commandments, these require us to be compassionate in the way we behave, to be open and generous in our responses to change. We don't love God less worshiping the way we do. Masks and soloists and sitting at a distance from one another, quite a distance in your case. All of these things still bring us together in the spirit because God is bigger than all of these restrictions. 
following common sense rules of public health does not negate the power of our gathering around the word or our gathering together at many tables. We do these things the way we do them now, in the spirit of the law of love, for the sake of the health of our neighbor. We love them because we love God. And because we love God, we must love them. And this today is what love looks like. So we refrain from singing together and we wear masks and we follow the visiting restrictions at nursing homes and hospitals, even though they're frustrating and they anger us. And we weep for those who can't be with the people they love. Because we choose to live by the law of love, we do these things. And as we are drawn to the table by that same love, we are reminded by the very strange and disruptive nature of today's gathering that the visible signs of God's invisible grace are not restricted to our usual notions of holy ritual or holy and sacred spaces. Gymnasiums. Gymnasiums become a place of the holy. Kitchen tables, living rooms, patios. I don't know where you are. It doesn't matter. God is there. All of these places are places where the love of God is at work. Each of these is a place where the love of Christ resides. And so I hope that we discover that it is around our various tables that the law is made simple again. Yes, there are strange new rules. Yes, you will have to play follow the leader to get to the altar. Yes, you might wait longer to partake in the body and blood of Christ than you would have ordinarily. But here is God's love waiting for you, calling to you. For all our attempts to justify and to qualify, for all of our attempts to set the rules in order so that we are comfortable, here, God says, I am God and you are not. Here, at this table, God expresses God's love for us. And in our stumbling, distanced, and very eager way, we will attempt to share that love with and for one another. Be at peace, friends, and know that God is with you, that God is calling you even now to join in the great feast. Amen. All glory, honor, might, and majesty in this and in all things be given to God and to God alone, now and always. Amen. Beloved, as we gather in new ways to do old things, we are more aware than ever before of the mysterious and miraculous gift of the Spirit of God in our midst. It is that Spirit which compels us to try new ways to worship, new ways to do the business of the Church, new ways to share the visible signs of God's invisible grace. Today we are challenged to share the story of Jesus' passion, death, and resurrection by our actions taken around many tables. And so I remind you that we do not celebrate this sacrament in solitude, and we do not rejoice in vain. The same Lord who stilled the raging storm and bent to wash the feet of his disciples calls us to remember his living dying and rising at the tables 
we together occupy. So bring to these tables your willingness to be fed. Bring your sense of wonder. Bring open minds and joyful hearts to, feast, to the feast that Jesus has set for us. Our tables are his tables. Christ's presence makes them holy. Let us give thanks together with all God's people. The Lord be with you. And also Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is our greatest calling and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God, creator and sustainer of heaven and earth. You spoke. And at your word, all things took shape and came into being, the sun and moon and stars, the sky and earth and waters, and all they contain. At your instruction, your spirit swept over creation, bringing order out of chaos and life out of the formless void. From the elements of the earth, you created us as unique and distinct people, but all in your holy image. You breathed life into us and called us to love and serve you and to live with you and one another in covenant community. But we turn away from you and we have tried to live apart from you and one another, but you never turn from us. Through the prophets, you call us back to you and to your ways. In the fullness of time, you sent your son the way, the truth, and life. He was born of a mother's flesh to reveal the full extent of your grace and love. Again and again, you welcome us and receive us with the open and welcoming arms of your divine love. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with those from every time and place to proclaim with them your glory in the unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy is your son Jesus, walking this earth, feeding the hungry, calling the lost, seeing the forgotten, touching those in need of healing, teaching those who sought out wisdom, and loving all. He showed your kingdom in your world. In breaking bread and sharing wine with your people here and in all places, we recall together the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Spirit upon us and upon these offerings of bread and wine. Gather your church together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom where peace and justice are realized, so that with all your people we share the banquet with which you have promised and provided. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ. All honor and glory are yours, creator and sustainer of all. Glory to you forever and ever. Amen. And now we pray the family prayer together which Jesus taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, power, and glory are yours now and forever. 
Friends, we do at these tables what Jesus did on the night of his arrest and betrayal. For when he had gathered with his friends, Jesus took bread, offered a blessing, broke it, and offered it to them and said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he said to them, this cup is the new covenant sealed with my blood. Drink it, all of you, and remember me. So it is that every time we gather together to share this bread and this cup, we proclaim our Lord's death until he comes again. Beloved, the gift of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
And let us pray. Generous God, in this sacrament, you have put new life into our hands. Now we put our lives into your hands. Take us, renew and remake us. Once what we once were is past. Our future in Christ is your gift to us. Help us by your spirit to treasure that gift and use it for your glory. Amen. I invite you to stand for the benediction, please. Christ does not invite us to sit at table only with him, to eat and drink only with him, to fellowship only with him. Rather, Christ invites us 
to go out into the world to act with grace, to work for justice, to speak good news, and to love our neighbor as God loves us. Let us go from here to act and work and speak and love as Christ invites us. And may the blessing of the triune God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, go with you all. Amen. Thank you.